What's up, bio nerdlings? In today's podcast, we're going to be talking about natural selection. So let's go ahead and get started. Before I get into natural selection, I just wanted to start off with the definition of evolution, as I'm sure you guys have all heard. Evolution is change in population's genetic makeup over time. I'm sure from your freshman year on, you've been told a million times. I'm going to tell you one more. Evolution cannot affect individuals. It's change in populations over time. Individuals cannot evolve. I can't go swimming every day for 40 years, and then on my 40th birthday, I have webbed hands. That would be super cool, but unfortunately, it's just not going to happen. All right, so before we get into natural selection, we need to talk a little bit about the father of evolution, of course, Mr. Charles Darwin. So Darwin loved nature and he actually studied to be a clergyman before he decided to set sail on the HMS Beagle. Now, one of the things people don't really know about, everybody kind of just thinks, you know, that Darwin was kind of like, evolution, evolution, evolution. He was actually really, really scared about presenting his theory of evolution because he was such a religious man. Um, before that, he was also studying to be a doctor and then he observed a surgery and Back in those days, there wasn't very good anesthesia and things like that, so surgery was pretty gory. So after that, that was when he decided to be a clergyman. Uh, eventually, he got very, very interested in insects and got eventually hooked up um, to one of the ships. So that would be the HMS Beagle. So he took off for a voyage around the world. It seems really magical and amazing, but most of the time he was on the boat, he was kind of like, Bleh! Uh, so Charles Darwin was actually extremely, extremely seasick whenever he was on the HMS Beagle. So whenever they were sailing around and they would dock at port, he would kind of ask the captain, hey, you know, where's the next port? And he would actually try and get there any way possible without getting on a boat. He would ride horses, he would walk, um, but every time he got on the boat, he was extremely, extremely seasick. So it was a pretty miserable trip for him. Um, eventually, when he got back, he did not publish his findings right away. Uh, he waited years upon years upon years before actually publishing his book on the origin of species because, again, he was so very religious and he didn't want to upset anybody. But eventually he published on the origin of species. Uh, Charles Darwin also came up with the theory of natural selection. Natural selection is the process whereby organisms that are better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring and then their offspring live to survive and produce more offspring, and so on and so forth. So Darwin hypothesized that all of life descended from a common ancestor. One of his most famous, if not the most famous sketches, was this right here from his journal. And he wrote up here, it's why it's circled, I think. And then he drew this. So basically one is kind of like the common ancestor, and then he has all of these branches going out. So he has A and B and C and D basically saying that all life has descended from some type of common ancestor. So according to Darwin's theory of natural selection, competition for limited resources results in differential survival. That's where the whole saying survival of the fittest comes in. The most fit individuals for that environment are the ones that live, reproduce, and pass on their genes to their offspring. So Different types of competition, it could be competition for resources, uh, food, water, shelter, uh, competition for mates. So things like that are all competition for limited resources. And those all play into the survival of those individuals. So individuals with more favorable phenotypes are more likely to survive and produce more offspring, thus passing on their traits to future generations. So one example that I like to use are elephant seals. So individuals with more favorable phenotypes. Phenotypes are the way that something looks. So male elephant seals are huge. They have these like nasty little like wrinkly things on top of their heads. And you know, so the females want to mate with the biggest, baddest male out there. Unfortunately, the cute little nerdy male seals, you know, kind of like on the side, maybe like some of you guys, they can't, they don't really care about the brains so much as their brawn in the seal world. So the females see like this huge male seal and he kind of like sits up at the top of a rock and he has a harem of female seals. 
and he is the only one allowed to breed for them. So that's competition of resources. He has the most desirable phenotype because he is the biggest, baddest mamma jamma in that group of seals. He's the one, he stands on the top of the rock, he has this ugly thing, he's like, Rah! So that is the male elephant seal, or my interpretation of the male elephant seal. But the females want to mate with that biggest, baddest dude because he's going to ensure that their offspring are healthy. They see him on top of the rock, he's like the grand pumbaa of seals. They want their offspring to be the grand pumbaa of seals. They want them to be big and bad and be able to defend themselves and find food and pass on their genes to their offspring. So natural selection, again, was what Darwin proposed as a mechanism of evolution, basically how organisms evolve. And that's one of the mechanisms through natural selection. So a population can change over time if individuals with more fit traits leave more offspring than the less fit individuals. Basically, the biggest, baddest dude gets to breed and survive. And his offspring have his genes and they pass his genes on to future offspring. So looking at these very exciting dots, we're going to talk about the same thing. So we have a light gray dot. Light gray dot does the hokey pokey and gives birth to three dots. One white, one light gray, and one dark gray dot. So eventually a mutation occurs. And that mutation means that any of the white dots are now dead. So that's a bad, bad mutation. So of course, any of the white dots are going to die. They're not going to be able to survive, to reproduce, and pass on their genes to the next generation. So that unfavorable mutation basically leaves light gray and darker gray. So reproduction occurs, and of course, we only have light gray and shades of darker gray. So for those of you that aren't partially colorblind or things like that, you can actually tell these are four different shades of gray. This is a super light gray, a eh, little bit more, a little bit more gray, and the darkest gray. So reproduction mating occurs and favorable mutations are more likely to survive. So again, the favorable mutation in this sense or in this example are the dark gray ones. So eventually you're only going to see dark gray individuals. Another of the most famous examples that you probably played with when you were, I would say probably like seventh grade on one of those, you know, online websites that your teacher hooked you up with was probably this beetles example. Uh, so, you know, these birds are like, yummy, 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 green beetles. So all of the birds like the green beetles. This has nothing to do with, you know, orange and green beetles being attracted more so to an orange than a green, nothing to do with that. This is all purely what's able to survive. So in this instance, the green beetles are more visible to the birds. So the birds are going to peck at those green beetles. So they're going to eat the green beetles. So guess what? More of the orange beetles are left alive. So the orange beetles breed and they produce more orange beetles. So eventually the birds eat all of the green beetles and the orange beetles are the ones that are continuing to, you know, live, reproduce, pass on their genes to their offspring. So you see a huge population of orange beetles and you might see a couple of the green beetles still left over but predominantly it will shift towards that orange coloration. So Darwin observed adaptations of plants and animals and he also saw fossils in South America and that's when he kind of started to think like man you know these fossils they kind of look a lot like some of the things I see out in the world today. So the fossils resembled modern animals and Darwin began to consider that those fossils belonged to ancestors of the modern species that he was seeing that day and age. So in the Galapagos Islands, Darwin observed that animals were very similar to the very big mainland, but slightly different on each of the little islands of the Galapagos. So one of the examples are tortoise shells. So each of the tortoise shells had a different adaptation for the different island that they were on. Now, of course, the most famous observation by Darwin was his finches, and that's what we talk about all the time and you hear a lot about him. So he discovered, or observed, I should say, that all of those finches from the mainland that had radiated out to all of the different islands had adapted to that island environment. Some adapted to eat, you know, seeds, some adapted to eat insects, some adapted to eat insects in trees, and each of them developed a specialized beak 
that allow them to feed in their specific area. So they each have a little niche within the habitat that they inhabit and their beaks are what allows them to feed. And so all of the beak types are specialized again to the islands that those finches are on and what food source is available to them. The stouter, you know, shorter beaks, those are gonna be more powerful for crushing seeds. Uh, the little longer beaks are gonna be better for pecking at insects. So Darwin inferred that adaptation to the environment and the origin of new species are related. And he called this descent with modification. That was basically his way of referring to evolution because Darwin didn't use the word evolution right off the bat. He called it descent with modification. So some of Darwin's observations. Well, he observed that populations change over time as evidenced by the fossil record that he observed while he was on his travels. Well, he wasn't yakking off the side of the boat. Um, there were always more offspring produced than the preceding generation. Um, he observed that if populations were left unchecked, they would grow exponentially. But of course, populations are put in check by different limiting factors. Uh, Darwin used an example of elephants to explain this. So he basically said that, you know, saying nothing happened. He estimated that if elephants underwent unrestricted reproduction, like no harm, no foul, um, every time an elephant could get pregnant, they did get pregnant. They gave birth to a viable offspring who grew up to be a very happy elephant, have its own little elephant babies. Um, and that in about 740 to 750 years, there would be 19 million elephants produced from just one original pair. Now, obviously that doesn't hold true. Um, this was basically his, you know, kind of showing it would be exponential growth, but of course it's not going to be an exponential growth. We might have some exponential growth and then it levels off because of limiting factors. We have carrying capacity, you know, limiting resources, all of those things come into play. So Darwin observed that resources, of course, are limited. So food is limited, water is limited, mates, space, all of those are limiting factors. So he also observed that variation is heritable, meaning that you inherit different types of variation from your parents. So to summarize, there are variation within a given species and the majority of this variation is inherited. So for example, looking at this litter of cute little kittens, uh, the litter of kittens vary with respect to the coat pattern and color. And any variation to some degree can affect the ability of the organism to reproduce and contribute genes to the gene pool thus affecting evolutionary success. So maybe for some reason, these little baby cats are born and all of a sudden it is unfavorable to be a black cat because they're out in the sun. And the black cats overheat first because their hair, you know, is more dark. So they die off, you know, something like that. So there, there can always be something that happens and I'm not saying that actually is, you know, happening to these cats here, but that's just one of many examples. I mean, in humans, if you're constantly removing one type of hair color from the population just because we don't like it, maybe we don't like redheads or we don't like people with blonde hair and we keep removing those people from the gene pool, um, we're only going to be left with people who have darker hair. Um, but again, any variation can affect the ability of an organism to reproduce. It doesn't necessarily have to be a genetic, you know, variable as in, you know, they have some mutation that makes them weak or anything like that. It could just be appearance. Um, and then some inherited traits are beneficial and they contribute to survival. So adaptations and fitness. An adaptation is a genetically controlled trait that is favored by natural selection and it gives that organism a reproductive advantage and it ensures that that trait is passed on to its descendants. So for example, we have our antelope hair right here. Now, if you look at it, some of the observations you should make of how it's adapted to its environment has really long ears. Um, obviously, help them here, but those really long ears, because this is a desert hair, it's going to help them to get rid of some of their excess heat. It has shorter fur, it has really long legs that are going to help it run or hop, whatever you want to call its mode of transportation, uh, very quickly. And then looking down here, if you look at our little snowshoe hair, it's adapted to its environment as well. It blends into its environment. It's 
boat, it's fur color. Uh, its ears are shorter because it's trying to conserve heat since it's in a colder area. Um, the traits that these exhibit can allow those individuals to survive longer and it will increase the reproductive rate of that individual. So, you know, rabbits with, you know, in this situation for the antelope here, the longest ears, the longest legs that can escape the fastest are the ones that are going to be left behind to reproduce and pass on their genes. Uh, the hairs down here, the ones that are, you know, a little bit more furry, uh, blend into the environment, um, you know, avoid predators, those are going to be the ones that live to pass on their genes to their offspring. So another famous example of natural selection are the peppered moths. And all of you, I would hope, have heard about the peppered moths before. So before the Industrial Revolution, you know, there are two types of moths. We had the white peppered moth and the black moth. You know, they're on trees. And of course, the trees are really beautiful and pristine. You know, their bark is a light color. So the birds would come down and bam, they'd snatch up those dark black moths because those were the ones that the birds could more easily see. Well, fast forward, and you know, us humans were kind of always messing up everything. So industrial revolution and, you know, <coughs> soot everywhere, smoke, nastiness. Um, so soot covers all of the trees. So of course, all these beautiful trees are now dark and nasty and dingy because of all of the soot and pollution. And so guess what? The black moths blend into that bark better. So now the birds peck and they get at the white peppered moths more easily because they are the more visible moth. And so the population of black moths increases. So this is happening uh, microevolution. Obviously, micro means small at a very small level or a molecular level. So a gene is a sequence of DNA nucleotides that specify a particular polypeptide chain. So if you think about, you know, way back in biochemistry, we're kind of adding things together. So nucleotides, uh, we have our codons. Codons come together. Um, then they form amino acids. Amino acids linked together form a polypeptide chain. We also have alleles. I know I'm like bringing in all this stuff from genetics and your brains are probably like, ah, uh, we're almost done though, I promise. So an allele is a particular form of a gene. So for example, we have big B, which represents the allele for the black wing color of the moth. And then we have the little B, which represents the white wing color. Um, selection acts on the phenotype, so not the genotype. This is based solely on how those moths look. Back in the day, the big B moths, the black moths, they got eaten. It wasn't good to have the dominant trait. It was good to have the recessive trait. But after the Industrial Revolution, it was good to have big Bs because they were darker. Um, so natural selection acts on the individuals, but only populations evolve. So this is an example. Natural selection acted on the individuals. It acted on before the revolution, industrial revolution took place. Natural selection was acting on those black moths, or against it, I should say. Uh, those were being selected against because they were more visible to the birds. After the industrial revolution, natural selection was acting against the white moths. So now the white moths are the ones that are visible and being seen, and natural selection was acting for the black moths because that was now the favorable phenotype because it was less visible, and so those moths were left to reproduce. So there are inferences that were made. So one, production of more individuals than can be supported by the environment leads to a struggle for existence, with only a fraction of those offspring surviving each generation. So again, survival of the fittest. Um, an example of this, tons of you know little baby sea turtles are born but they have to make it to the ocean. And guess what? On the way to the ocean, seagulls are eating and pecking. So all those offspring that are being produced, only a few of them survive to even get into the ocean. And then even fewer of those survive to a viable breeding age. Uh, two, fitness. Individuals whose inherited traits confer an advantage have a better chance of surviving in a given environment and will leave more offspring. Again, survival of the fittest who's the best adapted to that environment. And inference number three, unequal fitness will lead to gradual change in a population with favorable traits accumulating over time. So over time, a population might eventually accumulate enough change to become a new species. Uh, and that occurs through speciation. I mean, it could occur through geographic isolation, reproductive isolation, 
and we'll get into that a little bit later. But again, evolutionary fitness is measured by reproductive success. So I'm going to leave you with this beautiful, beautiful picture of a very reproductively successful individual, the cockroach. Well, I hope you learned something. This is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.